Hi, you're here. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Can you hear me? Put your earphones on. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can. Oh, good. We're in practice mode, but I'm going to go ahead and bring everybody else in. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so we've opened the room to all the attendees. So you guys, welcome. Come on in the room. Amy and I are here. I think I can share us side by side just like that. Super excited. Welcome to our webinar, everyone. Recognizing healthy hoof, the healthy hoof at a self-defense. <laughs> Just gonna give everybody just a couple of minutes to get here. I know we're starting a couple minutes late. We had a link issue, but we're linked now and we're together. Very good. Oh, gallery view. Yeah. So Tony and I had a little practice webinar this morning, so we're all warmed up and ready to go. So welcome everyone. I'm Mary Ann Brewer, and I'm a horsemanship coach from here in New Jersey, and most of you probably know me. Um, but I coach people from all over the world online, and it's fabulous for the love of horses, I have to say. And i um, just going to take a second to introduce Tony. She sent me a long bio. <laughs> I'm going to tell you who she is. Tony's a lifelong student of the horse. Um, she began her journey into hoof care back in 2001, and she's a professional farrier now. And of course, it oh, was that. Sorry. Uh, did I lose you, Tony? She's all frozen, but she'll be back, not to worry. Um, so back in 2001, um, Tony got a horse that needed some rehabbing. I'm having an internet connection. You keep work on it. I'm going to keep talking about you, Tony. <laughs> I can see you fine. Okay. Okay, good. Keep so doing me. that. Hold on. Yep. I'm going to see if I can fix my internet connection. Okay. I'm going to just mute you for a second, Tony. Can you hear me? I'm going to just mute you while I um, read your bio and you keep working on your internet connection. Yes. Okay, good. Well, I muted her. So if she looks like she's talking and we can't hear her, that's because she's muted. So Tony got a horse named Dusty and he was a horse who um, was not sound. And so out of self-defense, she began to figure out how to have um, healthy farrier care. And she went on a search and she found a whole bunch of mentors, uh, Carrie Christensen, Daisy Bicking, Pete Ramey, Esco Buff, Laura Florence, Cody Ovenacek. Steve Foxworth and Curtis Burns are all just some people in case you guys know any of those. Um, Tony went to school and she got her LPO certification and she's going to tell you what LPO is when she, when I unmute her. <laughs> um, but Carrie, um, not Carrie, but Tony specializes and has a particular interest in helping the many, many horses these days who we come across, both of us in our practices, who suffer from metabolic syndrome, laminitis, and issues with founder. Um, these horses have taught Tony the importance of a multifaceted way of hoof management, uh, management as well as uh, diet and mineral balance. So she continues to learn and serve those horses. And she definitely offers consultation and support to other farriers as well um, from a distance. And we'll be sure to get all of Tony's contact information and we'll put it right in the group wherever you found the link to this is where you will find the link to Tony's information. Uh, but just so you know, um, Tony's horse Dusty is now sound and he provides therapeutic riding and equine assisted psychotherapy services down at Equine Assisted Therapy of New Jersey, down in South Jersey. And uh, Tony enjoys a whole host of other things. She plays her guitar. She loves to study classical dressage. She now has um, a lovely Andalusian horse. She loves healthy biomechanics and um, 
She likes just genuinely having a good time. So I'm grateful to Tony for being with us today because she really is a shareaholic and she's got a ton of information. And when I said she's a student of the horse, it's really true. So um, welcome everyone and welcome Tony. Thank you. Um, can you so hear me? We can, and you look great, by the way. Okay. So you're, you're there. We have a good um, internet connection. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So for those of you who are here, um, we're going to be checking in on the chat. Um, if you want to, if you have any questions and you want to type them in the chat as we go, so we don't lose the questions, you're welcome to do that. Our goal is to be talking to you for about the next 45 minutes and then taking about 15 minutes at the end of our um, session today for a question and answer about anything that might cut up, come up. Okay. Um, but Tony, I think we're ready to go. So I'm going to give you the screen and let you go ahead and take it away. Do you hear me, Tony? Super. Yeah, well, you thank you for having me and asking me to do this. Um, Marianne and I have had many conversations about horses and our friendship together and I was just so so excited to do this webinar because uh, we're both stewards of the horse and uh, this is just a really great opportunity to get together and share some information and hopefully empower people to um, to get out and look at their horse's feet and make some assessments and um, if they feel that their horse's hooves have some imbalances that they, they will now have some tools to make that assessment and I can provide some other networking opportunities and links and resources to help people uh, get their horses hooves healthier. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Tony, what is um, ELPO? The ELPO is the Equine Lameness Prevention Organization. Um, it was started by Gene Ovenek, who is famous for his method of natural balance, trimming, and shoeing um, there in Colorado. And they're a wonderful educational group. They have many uh, certifications, a very progressive group, and um, they've been very helpful in, in educating me about assessing distortions, particularly in hoof mapping. Super cool. We're going to share some hoof mapping with you tonight. That's really, really cool and interesting. And our goal here, you know, you guys tonight is to show you healthy form, a healthy foot. Not, we're not going to show you a bunch of lame hooves, but um, we want you to get used to identifying what the healthy foot looks like. So when you go out and you pick up your horse's foot, you're going to be able to see what a healthy hoof looks like or not. <laughs> right. Um, I have a selection of photos that show healthy hoof form. Um, it's, it's kind of tricky when you search for healthy hooves. Unfortunately, um, you have to sort through a lot of photos of unhealthy hooves. So we will learn by comparison also, but I do want to begin and end with images of healthy hooves. So you guys have a good idea of what that looks like. Super. So we, you want to share our little agenda, like what we're going to go through so people know? And yeah. Then, yep. And then sure. we'll, you'll, you can start sharing your screen. Yeah. So we will start with looking at healthy hooves. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why they're healthy. And um, then we'll move into a little video by the ELPO about hoof distortions. And it will show you some some landmarks, um, easy landmarks to find on the bottom of your horse's foot, and you can assess whether in fact it is distorted or not. Um, and then we can talk about what to do if in fact your horse's hooves are distorted or unfortunately if they're lame. Um, there are a lot of resources to help you out for that. Um, and we'll talk about um, a team approach, that's what I have found has worked the best, especially with lame horses. It's very important that you have a team that works well together of your vet, your farrier, your body workers, osteopaths, energy healers, homeopaths. Um, really, it takes a village. You need a good team to be successful. And you have to have a team that you trust. And um, 
you know, so that they can advise you and that you can feel comfortable in their advisement. So we'll talk about that, some troubleshooting when you have distortions and lameness. And then um, there's a topic that you wanted to discuss particularly, which um, was thrush. And um, that is something that's very important to identify and it goes unnoticed uh, very, very often. And, and I've come across many shod horses and, and trimmed barefoot horses. Well, not so many barefoot horses, a lot of barefoot hoof care practitioners are on top of thrush, I have to say, but many shod horses that have had chronic central sulcus thrush, particularly, that has gone unnoticed for even years. Mm -hmm. And the horse has been deemed um, unsound or is sore on stones or has been diagnosed with navicular syndrome or heel pain, when in fact the horse just has a severe bacterial infection in the back of its foot and its frog and its uh, digital cushion, and it can even work its way all the way to the tendons. Um, it can be real bad, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I've um, seen that, Tony. I've seen that in um, hoof dissections, um, just horses that had severe thrush, and how you can see it go. It went up so far up the well through the whole hoof, through the whole you know started at the bottom and worked its way up. So it's a yeah, yeah. it's one of the things that. I think that you're right, goes undiagnosed, and I don't think people pay enough attention to it. Yeah, I think one of those images that you're speaking about of a hoof dissection is a photo of um, a hoof pick inside of central sulcus. Mm -hmm. And I actually was there for that dissection <laughs> uh, with a woman named Paige Poss, who is an excellent um, hoof care practitioner and she does beautiful dissections and she has some books that talk about anatomy and show you dissections but we were just utterly shocked at how deep that thrush had gotten and it was actually to the deep digital flexor tendon or the yes yes the superficial and the deep digital flexor tendon straight through the digital cushion so yeah. It was, uh, that must have been really painful for that horse. And if you can stick your hoof pick in your horse's heel, you have problems. So, but it can be treated. So, yes, never, don't despair. <laughs> don't despair, fret not. We have <laughs> remedies for that. So, anyway. can, can we just address one thing that you already kind of talked about? We really don't have to go over that again, I don't think. But what you were saying about, really um, assembling a team to really help you um, address these issues. You know, I can't um, stress enough how you are your horse's advocate. Even if you're a brand new horse owner and you don't know what you're talking about and what you're looking at, um, we want you to really get clear about what a healthy hoof does look like. But what I really, I want to encourage you guys to know is that um, you, you, you have powers of observation, especially if you've downloaded my free ebook. And if you haven't, you'll go to my website and download that today, maryannebrewer.com. It's just an ebook about really clean observation, really being able to see what there is to see. And then being able to own that. I want to really empower you to be able to own your opinions. And that doesn't mean you get on a soapbox, but it means you stand your ground and you ask questions. And if you don't like the answers, you ask more questions and you ask different people and you get more opinions because I cannot tell you how often I've seen people just turn over their farrier care to their farrier or they'll turn over their health care to their vet and they get kind of um, just um, divorced from it because, because we don't know until we know. So I really, really do want to encourage, um, encourage you to find teams that do work together. And I had a personal experience when my colt fractured his coffin bone of how um, the teams really work together. You know, the vet, um, he, he hadn't had the experience that the farrier did at reading radiographs. And the radio or the, the farrier was able to teach the vet and the vet was willing to learn and the vet was willing to listen. That's, that's called working together. Like that's what we, we want. We want teams that can actually work in concert. So I just want to really give you guys encouragement about um, being able to question and being able to get, get answers and being able to observe. So yeah. I think we could, 
Yeah. Check that off our list. A team. Yeah. That's, that's a great thing to say and I won't elaborate much on it, but I certainly support that notion. And, um, you do have to trust your professionals yet at the end of the day, you are your horse's advocate and their steward. And, um, it only benefits them if you are educated so that you can make informed decisions for them. Do not divorce yourself from it and completely rely on the opinions of your, your vets and your farriers. Um, not that you shouldn't trust them, but right. you should question them. Um, you should ask a lot of questions. And if something doesn't sit right with you, um, your, your intuition is, is always right <laughs> so listen to that if you have a gut feeling examine it and ask questions and find different people that can can answer those questions for you so yeah i couldn't agree more i tell people that all the time i want you to be able to observe but i want you to trust yourself too yeah that's yeah, good so in addition to those things we have a couple more topics well we'll talk about um diet lifestyle um, diet and lifestyle that lend itself to um, healthy hooves, and um, and also um, some behavior, horse behavior, that may be telling you that your horse may have um, a hoof-related problem. Um, there are some signs from a behavior perspective that will um, that will give you some information about how your horse's feet are feeling. So um, other than identifying some distortions and understanding some landmarks on the hoof, uh, there are also some behavioral indicators that can give you information as well. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get back to looking at healthy hooves. I want to end on images of healthy hooves. It's difficult, it's hard to find on the internet. Um, I always found that interesting. And even doing hoof dissections, you know, it was like, uh, you know, it was a, it was like a search for the healthy hooves. Um, so I'd like to change that. That's yeah. part of my job. <laughs> I like it. To help I like change it. that. I would like to see more healthy than unhealthy hooves. Flood the internet with healthy hooves. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was always, um, I was always, I remember when I first started learning about, when I first started reading Pete Ramey's information and he talked about rock, crushing bare hooves you know so that's always been an image for me like your horse steps on the rock and they don't get a stone bruise the rock right. just crushes right. i love that it's hard and calloused and and strong sturdy and strong right <laughs> cool. so let's think of those hooves so we'll go ahead actually yeah. if you're ready yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going ready. to uh i'm going to do my best to navigate this Zoom thing. Yeah, she's gonna share her screen. You watch or go. You just watch me. We're gonna see how it goes. Yeah. So we'll make uh, Tony's screen nice and big and let her work on sharing that for us. Yes. So here actually, uh, we'll start with, um, where is this nice little, um, it's not all good. It's in the back here of our, um, there's a comparison of oh lord there's a comparison of um i thought it was right here that's a pretty healthy hoof it has a couple distortions so we'll go back to the one that i really wanted to show you which is you know way back here in the list um, just so you know we can't see it oh good <laughs> um well let's see i want to see if i can um go back to um Go back to my share screen. Let's try this again. Um, okay, I'll put this hit the share screen button. Perfect. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, super. All right. So um here's a website actually of um some folks out in Southern California, um, Saucity and Mario. They um they are a team and they operate in Southern California. They have a company called Wild Heart Hoof Care, and I just, I just love their work. And you can actually see how they're able to transform unhealthy hooves into healthy hooves. 
um, there are some reasons that this, and I say, you know, we learn by comparison. It, it's, it's really true. I mean, if you look at these two feet, uh, you can see some, some clear differences between the two of them. So here are in this hoof, um, you can see these hoof rings, these divergent hoof rings and this curved coronary band. These cartilages back here in the heel bulbs are a little jammed up. You have a very shelly, broken hoof wall, and you have a heel point. That is what we call underrun here. So that means that the load-bearing surface in the heel, the rearmost load-bearing surface, is much farther forward of this heel bulb here, and the tubules are angled forward. You can see they're working on getting those heel points back, but they are farther back. They're much straighter. You have a much better quality wall and this is only in four months people so realize that you can go from this to this in less than a year less than six months um, if you have the right trim diet environment um, I will say that natural hoof care and barefoot hoof care is not it's not something you do because it's cheaper or easier necessarily. It's something you do to enhance the well-being of your horse and it's a more holistic practice. So understand that you as an owner have some some work to do on your part, some responsibilities, and hopefully you feel empowered by that because you, you have the ability to change your horse, horse's speed from this to this, okay? So just know that um, knowledge is power, and uh, if you have the tools, then you can facilitate a very positive change for your horse. So here we have another comparison, but look at this hoof. You know, it just, it's, again, it's a lateral view. I'll show you some sole views. Um, if you look at the dorsal wall of this hoof, um, I'm not sure how long the time is between these two, but you notice this big bump here. Um, we call that a bull nose appearance of the dorsal wall. And um, that is almost always indicative of what we call a negative palmar angle or plantar angle. This is probably a hind foot, if I were to guess. It looks um, like it. <laughs> so um, it means that your coffin bone is on a um, basically a slanted back axis, which puts undue stress on the heels. Um, on the tendons and ligaments within the joints and then up the limb and into the muscles and even all the way up, if it's a hind limb, all the way up into the pelvis and the sacrum and all the structures of the pelvis. So this is bad news bears here, people. If you see this, your horse has a lot of stress and strain on its hind end. And it would be much better if you could help stand him up a bit, so to speak, by helping him grow some heel height and help rotate this coffin bone into a more positive orientation. Now, if you guys don't know what any of that means, a um, little video that I'm going to show in a bit may give you some ideas about that. But just think negative is broken back. So angling toward the heel, like you have more sole in the toe than the heel, and more positive is standing the horse up kind of more on his toe. Obviously, extremes in any direction is not healthy, but just look at this nice hoof, how, how that horse looks so much more supported in the heel than he did however many months ago that was. He's a lucky chap for meeting these good trimmers. So here, this horse healed a big seedy toe crack. There's probably fungus and bacteria living in this toe crack. And look, it grew out. How beautiful. Um, I'm going to show you a sole view. Um, look at that beautiful compact hoof capsule. So again, look, we see this rounded kind of bullnose appearance. You even see this sort of buckle in the heel going into the quarter and you see the angle of the heel. This horse's load bearing point of his heels is like here, okay? So 
Zenosity and Mario were able to bring this horse's load bearing point. And says eight months. Back here. So, so eight months. Less than yeah, a year. Less than a year. That's a that's a really big difference there. That's really good. This is a nice hoof. If you yeah. have hooves like this, you are you're in good shape. So um here we have a couple soul views. Um some points to look at. This is not the best photo for comparison because it's a little bright, but you can see, look at the width of this frog from collateral groove to collateral groove. So the back, you know, the grooves on the side of the frog and just the width of this frog compared to the width of this frog. Hmm. The same foot in four months. This has gone to this. Yeah. Look at these heel points, these load bearing points of the heels. This one's kind of shoved up here. This one you can't really see because it's so bright but they were able essentially to move this horse's footprint back to be more in line with the widest part of the frog, the rearmost weight bearing structure of the frog. So these heel points here and here are much more under the bony column to support the limb. Um, look at the ratio. So this is something we're gonna talk about when we look at our hoof distortion video. So there are key landmarks. Um, there's one here at the back of the frog. So you see where basically the frog meets the heel. So this juncture, um, it's usually right in line with this dimple here. There should be a dimple, not a crack, not a Grand Canyon, but a nice little dimple in the back of the frog. So this is a line you're going to uh, train your eye to. So this landmark is important. Also, this landmark, you see how the wall comes around, turns at the heel, goes down the bar, and ends about there. In this photo, you can actually see the difference between outer wall, inner wall, and lamina. So if anyone is familiar with the lamina, um, you may understand that the lamina continues all, around, all the way around the heel point and ends in the bar. So the termination of the lamina in the bar. So where the lamina ends in the bar, so basically where your bars end, right around here, you'll see these little swells, if you will. It will kind of turn into a little circle. But for all intents and purposes, we're just going to say the end of the bars land about at the center of rotation, which lies approximately about at your coffin joint. So from here to here, we want to have 50-50 balance from here back and here forward to your toe. So that's the landmark we're going to talk about and you'll see in our little video that we're going to share. This is what we mean when we talk about having a 50-50 um, balance around the center of rotation. The hoof is a slanted cone, so remember it grows vertically, so these walls grow up high, so the hoof will grow up off the ground, but it also grows forward. So as the horse grows, these structures migrate forward. Okay. Little nuggets. So Tony, That's that can I just ask a question there about, yep. so those bars end essentially at the widest part of the hoof. Yes. Got and it. you can also find that spot by looking at the arc of the quarters, and it's about at the apex of the arc. Okay. Let's go about here and here. This foot may be able to come back a little bit more and mm -hmm. become more compact, mm -hmm. but for the most part, I would say that's a relatively good balance. It's only four months. I mean, geez, look at the difference in four months. It's huge. It's very cool. Very empowering. Mm -hmm. So even here, we have wow. a good balance. Oh yeah, look at that poor thing. I mean, he's he's got this ridge of sole, which is actually indicative of what we call a retracted sole. It's good to note here. Some of my clients, unfortunately, know what a retracted sole is. Um, we live in a wet area. Um, retracted soles happen in wet areas mainly. Um, so, you know, he's got a lot of separation. His heel points are like here and here. And look how far away the heel points are from 
the widest part of the frog. And look at this uh, contracted sort of lateral cartilages and digital cushion in here. Um, so this foot looks like a totally different foot. Look how elongated it is. That's distortion. Our slanted cone has gotten too out of balance. Mainly the toe's gotten too long. So look at this. Um, we brought the foot back into proportion. It brought these heel points back in line with the widest part of the frog. Our bars terminate right around here and here. This is about the widest, the widest part of your foot, also the center of rotation. And um, you have a pretty good balance from back to center and center to front. Just imagine that though, if you look at that, you know, that's a Grand Prix dressage horse. Can you just imagine, this is a hind foot, how hard it was for him to really have any real breakover and really get any true power or actually get his legs up underneath him with that long toe like that. Right. And um, he was asked to be doing these high level maneuvers and he probably did them, <laughs> you know? Right, right. <laughs> That is the amazing thing about our horses. Um, they, they go above and beyond to perform for us. So all the more reason why we need to be their stewards and give back to them. We really owe it to them. This horse was performing at a very high level on this very compromised hoof. And mm -hmm. I'm sure his owners just didn't know how to identify. Well, they probably did at some point. Maybe there was a lameness issue. Um, yeah, he had negative plantar angles, so he probably had a lot of hind end stress and strain. Mm -hmm. Probably had back probably issues, had probably back sacrum back issues, issues, maybe even kissing spine. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, there are, there are a number of postural problems that this causes, but um, so someone decided that he needed a change, so good for them. Um, yeah. So here we go, another bull nose negative plantar angle that's really a good one that's a really good picture to show, show that bull nose and that that the really the massive angle of that, that hoof yeah. yeah this is uh just tremendously stressful for the horse's hind end um so again nice tight round these folks do a nice um what we call a mustang roll or a bevel um, not all practitioners of natural hoof care or uh, other methods of hoof trimming do this nice bevel. I mean, I say nice because I prefer it, but you can have a healthy hoof without, without the bevel. I think it's, uh, it lends itself um, to leverage reduction. I think it um, helps minimize chipping and cracking. And uh, it's the same principle of like a beveled edge on wood or a table. It's just, I, I think smooth arcs are, are strong. <laughs> That's my opinion. So, you know, another cuff and you have a radiograph too. So here yeah. we go. And this is a good opportunity, Tony, not, not to necessarily teach people about radiographs or how to even read them, but um, just to let you guys know that you know how like when you go to the hospital and you get, you know, you, you, let's say you've broken something or they're trying to see if you've broken something and you, you go in and you get your radiograph and then it takes hours and hours and hours to get it read because they've just emailed it to India so somebody can read it. So yeah. There's a reason for that. You know, they're not, they're, they're it's, you know, they, it takes talent to be able to read the radiograph right. and not that with time and experience people can't do it but there's a reason why there's people specifically trained to do that you know so i just want to encourage you yeah. just to know that all people who read radiographs do not see the same thing <laughs> right right and that's why it's beneficial to have a good network of professionals that you know are accustomed to having um who either who are accustomed to reading radiographs, but even have their own radiograph equipment. Um, there are a few farriers slash hoof care practitioners that I know that have their own radiograph equipment, and they are experts at taking and reading radiographs. So yeah. find the experts. Don't yeah. you know? Find, just do your best. Um, there's ask. Plenty of ask. Yeah. Ask. And around. you know, 
there are this radiograph is like maybe not the best um th there are resources to to learn you could just do a quick google search about good radiograph hoof radiographs and um you, they'll talk about things like oblique angles and there's a little bit of a shadow here so it may not be a, sh a dead lateral shot um i've seen i've seen radiographs where the horse was standing next to the block or you have some other bizarre thing like obstructing your view or they're really cloudy and um you're there and your vets usually have a, a digital radiograph machine connected to their computer so you get to see the radiographs it, like instantly so if you see if it's unclear ask them to take another shot because you are paying good money for them um i mean not that they're ridiculously expensive but yeah but get the ones that you can see <laughs> right ones that you can see and ones that define these structures very clearly you want to see clear borders um you want to be able to see the opacity of the bones so that you can see things like density and calcification. See, this one's like really bright and they can adjust the brightness of it. Um, the reason I say that is because people send me radiographs of their horse's feet all the time. And there are many times where I say, I'm really sorry, but I, I can't read this radiograph because it's not a good shot. So, um, you know, that's just, food for thought. Um, it's hard to give people advice when they don't have a good, you know, set of yeah. rails. Train your eye. It's important. And you'll never know when you need, need it. Right. Is, you know, it'll come in handy. Right. So again, another four month apart comparison. Um, so one of our jobs as um, hoof care practitioners, one of my jobs as a hoof care practitioner is to understand the relationship between the bones and the hoof capsule. So um, my goal is to um, help facilitate um, a healthy phalangeal alignment, so alignment of the bones of the leg, um, help facilitate a healthy palmar angle. So I strive for about five to eight degrees positive. So um, from like here to here, I want a nice upward arc. Um, so here you see this horse has really, um, it's, it's negative. Um, you see the Palmar processes here in the back of the foot are a little lower than the toe. And, uh, and then from the side of the hoof, you know, it has this appearance. Um, so you have a lot of toe out here. We consider this a lever arm. And you see how the horse's whole limb is just angled backwards. P2, our short pastern bone, is um, really angled poorly. And uh, you can see the whole bony column is just cocked back. And it, it really creates a lot of stress and strain in the soft tissue structures in the back of the leg, here in the back of the foot, um, as the horse breaks over this massive big toe long toe so anywho that's pretty nice that, yeah, that that would be something tony all that pressure on the back of the leg and the back of the foot and that would cause a navicular issue right like a just, yeah just like concussion and yeah rubbing and whatnot right if this is, if this was a front hoof um it's rather uncommon for horses to have uh navicular it is, yeah it is a front hoof but um um left hind lateral this is oh, a hind, but, but i thought it was the one underneath but it. still I, i've seen um you know i've seen four you know four feet front feet that look like this also and mm -hmm. yes those horses normally have heel pain if you understand some basic mechanics and physics you can see where there's a lot more energy required and there's a direct correlation between stress breaking over here and stress in this joint. Um, there is a good video by um, the ELPO that that has some lines and shows lever forces in the back of the foot as relates to the lever arm in the front of the toe. There's a direct relationship between this leverage and this leverage back here. And that leverage back there, like the coffin bone sits inside of, show them a little, 
point, put your cursor where, where the coffin bone would kind of be. Um, not the coffin. Yeah, well, the coffin the bone. Navicular but bone? The navicular bone, right? Yep. There. So here's our navicular bone. Yeah. Um, yeah, so our deep digital flexor tendon runs right over this bone, right behind this bone, and attaches to the bottom of the coffin bone, the solar surface. Um, mm -hmm. It's an incredible attachment and it's an incredible tendon. It's uh, really thick and strong and amazing, but over time, if there is too much pressure here for one reason or another, um, you can see where we're having this bone angled back would put undue stress and strain on that area. This lever arm on the toe would create more leverage and stress and strain and tension mm -hmm. on this area. And also that now if the horse is sore in his heels, especially if this was a front foot, um, if he's sore in his heels, he will begin to land toe first, which is biomechanically, damaging and he will have a toe heel landing which then further concusses and stresses and strains this area so it's like a triple quadruple whammy yeah. back of the foot so you know no wonder so um so when we're observing our horses move you know observe how does the foot land on the ground does it land heel first or toe first right you know, excessively heel first or it, yeah <laughs> then there's that yeah. <laughs> you know there are some real ex extreme heel first landings um which so, probably means there's toe pain <laughs> right right so you'll develop your eye for that also so essentially tony they kind of want to see it land almost looking flat or just slightly slightly heel first right right are you going to show us that video you showed me this morning? Yeah, let's show you. Let's show yeah, you. I thought that was good to see how the hoof changes. Like they, oh, this is good. Yeah. So um, just oh, let me know, good. know, Marianne, if you think I should um, pause it at any point. I mean, I will if, if mm -hmm. I think that there's an opportunity, worthwhile opportunity. Um, so here we go. It is muted. Which is good, you guys, because there's a lot of loud music <laughs> all right yeah Come on. but this is really cool we we looked at this this morning when we were practicing and i really liked how they really just showed you over time how the toe can you know it starts out nice and tight and it grows out and down and forward and you can see it so you see who this is, right? EDSS hoof distortions. You can you can look at, at it for yourself, and you can listen to it if you want to. All right. So it will start to identify some of the structures of the foot. They're going to start with the frog, but just notice where they're starting here with this hoof. It's a relatively balanced hoof. Um, you know, it could be better, but for all you know, it's relatively speaking, you have your heel points in line with the widest part of your frog. Um, you have a pretty good ratio, it could be better uh, from back to the middle. So anyway, watch this as the video plays and it will give you a great image of how hoof distortions grow and occur. So all of these structures can become distorted individually and together. <clears throat> So functional sole is calloused sole. It's not chalky. That's one good uh, landmark to find. Your live sole plane. So here's our side view. Heel angle, toe angle are perfectly in line. Now look what happens. Can you go back and do that again? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I just think that is really helpful to see where we start and then where we get to, you know, yeah. and, how, and how, how just how quickly that can happen. Right. So yeah, it's nice and under the back of the foot and then you yeah. can see that heel just grows more and more forward. Yeah. yeah. So also watch, um, watch the hairline. Mm -hmm. 
in the heel especially. Look at this area, how it starts to curl under, mm. over and under as the heels get pulled under, as these heel points get dragged forward. So you'll see that happening. See our bars start to curve and see the relationship between these heel points. Oh, Nelly, that's a sad hoof. Oh, look at those see? bars. I have bars like that. Oh, oh that's very sad. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> seen them. First step is identifying, right? <laughs> so here are these points, some of these points I was talking about. Yeah, look how far away mm. these landmarks have grown away. And there's a shoe on that. Yeah, which, you know, okay, this is a great image. All right, so people are going to go, holy mackerel. There's a nail in the horse's toe. You have done quick the horse. Well, you will see how this did not quick the horse. Or when I say quick, I mean get into the sensitive soft tissue structures inside the hoof capsule. So we just watched that video of how the wall basically grows away from the coffin bone and those structures distort forward. So now take a look. It's going to show you the inside of this hoof. I love these uh, graphics. This is called the Metron software, where they basically help you envision the bone inside of the hoof capsule. So look, our dorsal wall has lost its parallel relationship to the dorsal surface of P3. This coffin bone is you know, beginning to get a bit of what we call a ski tip, which is indicative of chronic inflammation and uh, what we call distal descent. This bone isn't too terrible. There is some, some soul depth. Um, but look how this nail just goes right right through here that's you know i try to explain this to people sometimes when i'm working on laminitic horses who have what we call a big laminar wedge and i start blasting it off with my rasp and they look at me in horror and i go well you know <laughs> the wall has grown away from the internal structure so that's why i can do that that's why i have to do that <laughs> So, Tony, that horse is not necessarily in any danger of actually foundering. Can you, can you describe what founder actually is right here when we look at this? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, to say he's not in any danger of foundering, I don't know. Um, I don't know what his situation is, and I, I don't know why he's lost some um, suspension of his bone in his column i'm not you know he may just be long and this just maybe this flared toe and this long toe may just be the product of um just excess hoof growth but if we look here at the hairline um uh, this is about where the hoof wall begins to grow right about here from the coronary corium. There's a band of soft tissue here that begins to produce the dorsal wall lamina. So this is a marker. Um, when we do radiographs, we like to mark this, this spot actually because we measure the distance between this and this. This is called our extensor process of the coffin bone. It's where the extensor tendon attaches actually. So this is what we call distal descent. We have a degree of it. It's not the worst I've seen, but the bone has essentially fallen through the capsule. We have a weak laminar attachment here for some reason. So the strong um, structures, um, it's like Velcro is the best way I can describe it. It's like mm. a strong interlocking Velcro that attaches from the surface of the bone, the corium of this bone um, to the lamina of the hoof wall. So this, it's like this zipper connection that attaches the wall to the bone. That connection has weakened for some reason. Now, that could happen just from mechanics alone, just the fact that this lever arm here has basically pried the wall away. Um, and has weakened this lamina. So that's possible, but we do have a little bit of what we call a ski tip here. And um, I, I wonder what's going on with this horse. If I looked at this radiograph, I'd want to know about its diet and its lifestyle and its breed. So, um, you know, 
any degree, now people might freak out when they hear this, but any degree of distal descent is going to decrease your soul depth so that will create thin souls. It's also what we call sinking. So when people hear of sinker founders, I mean, now this is different. This would be like a uh, chronic sinking, if you will. Happens over time, a long time may not be a metabolic cause so there's just kind of chronic over time sinking so whenever and they call that sinking like when a horse founders it literally that coffin bone rotates right out the bottom of that foot so that little ski tip ends up right out the bottom of that sole yeah it, it, sure comes, can. Right, it comes right out founder is a nautical term yeah to run aground yeah so, yeah so, so this bony column can actually just fall through the capsule. And you say fall, it's not like it's detached, but it gets forced out. Yeah, well, it gets detached. Um, well, right. <laughs> it happens because there is some extreme insult to the laminar attachment here that holds this tightly into this capsule. So an acute sinker is uh, the most severe form of founder and it's when this attachment just lets go all the way through and um it's um it's a bad situation um i know a guy to call <laughs> when that happens and uh yeah you know um it, it can be remedied so at any rate we want to look at this relationship oh, look i started my thing again we want to look at our relationship between our uh, extensor process and our coronary band um so you see this nail just goes right through and doesn't hurt anything doesn't hurt anything we could trim that you know right off we could dress this to get in line um so yeah i mean this is a degree of sinking it's pretty minor i would say but um at any rate it can get worse. So let's talk about um, more distortions. We'll let this video play through a little bit and we'll see the sole. So that's about the widest part of the foot, our center of rotation, right around here, around our coffin joint. So look how it loses that 50 50 relationship. This is a nice markup here. Back of the frog, widest part of the foot. This is where your breakover should be. And they actually draw right on the foot. You actually measure it. You get a little little ruler. You measure. Yeah. Look how far our heel points are from the back of the foot. Um, this can really help you develop your eye. Um, I encourage you all to go look up live sole hoof mapping. And map on. They have guides that you can print out. So see this line here, this flat line, how it's um, straight from the hairline to about here, maybe about a quarter inch. This is connected growth here. This is what we call healthy connected growth. And from about this point on is where our, um, our dorsal wall starts to lose its parallel relationship to the coffin bone. So this is where our toe flare occurs, and this is where our lamina gets really stretched and leveraged on. So you can lay a ruler or your rasp all around your horse's hoof and check for flare and detachment. So here's oh, look at that one. That's so common. Yeah, flared feet. You have a weak laminar connection they look like they belong on a duck that is our typical duck foot There's don't let's let's not dwell on that let's go find we're, not dwell on that. we're gonna move on <laughs> Just look at the relationship though look at your yeah. ratios mm -hmm. they note there is a lot more mass ahead of the center of rotation than behind so just oh my aching back <laughs> the dorsal wall has deviated just below the hairline and the wall continues to flare from there down so that's connected and that's all stretched mm. common pathology directly and indirectly caused by hoof distortion navicular bone spurs so bony changes arthritis ring bone 
cough and joint disease, lesions of collateral ligaments, those are very common injuries, impar ligament, another common injury, and uh, something about deep digital flexor tendon. Yeah, basic guidelines for treating and preventing common horse distor hoof distortions. Map your foot <laughs> and trim to your, your hoof mappings in your landmarks. If anybody is here on the webinar and you actually do your own trimming, can you just say something in the chat and let us know that you actually do your own trimming? And if you're actually finding this helpful, because I do my own trimming and I've got, I've got an entire page of notes. <laughs> Yeah, already. I've been taking. Marianne and I have had hoof mapping parties, and um, <laughs> you know, it's just it's just something you can't do enough of. of you know, the more feet you look at, the better you train your eye. Yeah. All right, so you know, yeah. we should have this fifty-fifty balance around the widest part of the foot, the center of rotation. They're one and the same. Roughly. Alice is here and she's learning to barefoot trim. So we have at least one person who does their own trimming. Yeah, I think it's a great thing to do. Um, work with your health care practitioner um, in the beginning and they can check your work. And eventually you can be left to your own devices and it will help your horses to have more frequent, less dramatic trims. Um, heel should end close to the back of the frog. And a slight heel first landing should be encouraged. They say slight because you know they don't want an exaggerated heel first landing. Mm -hmm. um, the frog should contact the ground and good dirt compaction should be allowed to exist in the foot to encourage load sharing. So that's their little ditty on so that means Does that mean you don't have to clean your horse's feet every single day? Well, Correct. There are times when I will wait until after my ride to clean my horse's feet. Um, I'm a bit of a, um, I, I'm a bit of a hoof fungus and bacteria Nazi. So I like clean, dry, hard feet. And mm -hmm. I like to work my horses on terrain that maybe will compact into their feet like sand and grass and, mm -hmm. um, it's good for your horses to have different terrain to work on, but no, you don't, you don't always have to pick them. Sometimes that pack does provide some soul support and arch support. So what would we not want to leave in our horse's hooves? Any, anything, well, manure is not a good thing. If it's clean dirt, I'm okay with that. <laughs> clean dirt and sand. If there's manure, um, if there's any smell of, disease or infection, you need to clean that out. You may need to soak it. You may need to treat it with topical product. Um, it's very important to keep your horse's frogs healthy. So any black um, exudate and um, any black stinky wet um, tissue or just any nastiness in the collateral grooves, um, you want to remove and you want to clean out and get dry. And Do you have a favorite thrush busting product? Um, on, on a daily level, um, I'd like to use no thrush powder just as a preventative. How um, do you use that if, it's, if the foot's already dry? Um, it will stay down in the collateral grooves if you pack it. I okay. like to tamp it. <laughs> I call, I tamp it down. You okay. push it with your finger. Just push it down into the bottom of the collateral groove. Um, I will use it sometimes on separated white lines, um, if there's just a little separation. Um, a product I like to use in the frog and in any separated uh, white line areas uh, is a product called Artemud. It is a clay product and it has wonderful things in it like honey and eucalyptus and... Uh, like tea tree, doesn't it? Tea like tree. And there's some other ingredient in it, but it smells wonderful and it stays, it sticks. So that's very good for white line disease. Um, any chronic thrush of the collateral grooves, um, it's sometimes hard to get in the bottom of a central sulcus if you have central sulcus thrush. Um, so uh, I like it for white line disease and and collateral groove thrush mainly. I also use it under my uh, dental impression material when I glue on composite shoes. It keeps the foot very clean and dry. 
Um, another product that's very helpful for central sulcus thrush is um, it's actually an antibiotic cream used for mastitis and lactating cows. And there are two versions of it. There's one called Today and Tomorrow. And it's a... Uh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> I did not choose who, the name. I was going to say, who made that up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, it's oddly enough, the one called Tomorrow... <laughs> actually I've heard works faster and better and the wonderful thing about that product even though I don't like to handle antibiotics a lot um, or use them really if unnecessary but at any rate what's good about that product is that it has a very thin applicator tip and you can get it to the bottom of that central sulcus so um, that's the crack in the heel that's not supposed to be there. That's the crack in the heel that's not supposed to be there. In fact, I can uh, I can go ahead and horrify some of you. With, well, let's not leave people horrified. Horrify well, us, but then get let's get to good pictures so we can. Let's um. Well, things. do we want to talk about central sulcus thrush? I think so. Just because well, it's it's nasty. Let's just educate you. We're not and going I, to horrify yeah. you. We're and I do I do think it's something that people don't even really know. Um, there's a chat. Uh, Candace says no urine soaked bedding and manure in your horse's hooves. Yes, urine soaked is should not be no. in your horse's hooves. No bueno. Yeah. Um, hold on. Let me just. So I had a picture, you know. The Red Horse Soul Paint. Have you heard of that? It's yes. Great. Same company as Artemud. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Candace. The Red Horse Soul Paint. Yes. Red Horse makes a ton of products, and um, they have a spray, actually, that's really wonderful. Um, so here are a number of photos of... Central sulcus thrush. Oh. So this crack here. Um, oh, yeah. Some like people wouldn't, they wouldn't think necessarily. Uh, sometimes you know that this would hurt, but it does. So some people also um, will. So you see how this applicator tip goes down into that crack. Mm -hmm. That one's not even really that severe. That doesn't. Okay, here we go. Here's the picture I'm going to show. The hoof pick is in the back of the foot, just sitting there. Um, that is no good. So today and tomorrow cream, Seferin something, it's, it's an antibiotic, um, has a very small tip that you can get down into that crack. And um, I like to soak the hoof um, first. There's a product called Clean Tracks that I find very effective. Um, so I do that first. Some people will floss this crack with um, like surgical scrub or iodine or uh, other antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial products. So you can do that, but I, I've had success just soaking it and then treating it daily with today or tomorrow cream. And then once this heals, you won't be able to stick your hoof pick in it, but you still may have a little depression here. Uh, like I said, a thumbprint is normal, like a little callus dent is normal. And you'll see this foot is normal. Mm -hmm. You see this central sulcus is um, just a little dent or just a little frog spine in there. And that is a healthy. That's healthy, frog. that's beautiful. This is a healthy frog. This is a diseased frog. So, you know, no wonder your horse would want to land on its toe. Mm -hmm. That was happening back there. So mm -hmm. this is thrush. Um, don't, don't let thrush happen. Mm. And if it happens, you know, treat it. All right. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, good. <laughs> We don't <laughs> go on about that. No, no. Um, Unless there are questions, you know, if anyone had a question about it, I certainly would answer it. But Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Does anybody, um, you need to stop sharing your screen. Stop share. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions that we haven't answered? Because if if you if you don't have any questions, we're just, um, we're going to, we're coming to the end of our meeting soon. And there's a few things that, 
um, I'd like to just talk about and, and go ahead if you have any questions just put them in the in the chat um, but uh, some of the things let's just talk a, a, for a couple of minutes about healthy diet and healthy living environment like how does your how do you actually have a healthy foot on your horse where do you get that <laughs> um, well you you feed your horse for healthy hooves um, proper mineral proper mineral balance is key to having healthy hooves when i come to a new client and i see that the hoof walls or the laminar connection are compromised um, i talk about diet and i talk about minerals and i recommend minerals um, our environment our soil is very depleted of minerals we've been over farmed um, we've had a lot of wash out and um, if you test your hay which i do um, you will see some patterns um, that that hay and grass is um, pretty deficient in many trace minerals and major minerals so um, there are some supplements that i recommend um, i also really believe in balancing um, balancing your hay. So getting a hay analysis and understanding what your horse is getting. They, um, they don't always get, uh, it's, it's not always very bioavailable through your pelleted feeds that are heated and processed. And a lot of people believe that what's in the feed is uh, everything a horse needs. And that's not necessarily the case. You lose some nutrition just because they put it in doesn't mean that that is necessarily absorbed. And there are reasons that the horse may have issues with absorption, but for the most part, you need to know what's in your hay. Um, for healthy hooves, um, generally speaking even your high metabolism horses it's a good rule of thumb to have hay that's lower starch and sugar um, carbohydrate overload is known to cause inflammation of the lamina whether it's a high octane high metabolism racehorse uh, or um, you know obviously they're using their carbohydrates more but they can still suffer from carbohydrate overload. But it's more important for your slow metabolism horses that um, are easy keepers and who have evolved to live on very little nutrition and very little energy. So like your Tennessee walking horses, your ponies, your miniature horses, um, they need a diet that's very low in starch and sugar. Um, if you start to see signs of um, carbohydrate overload, which include hoof rings and um, a crusty neck and um, an over-conditioned body score, like a, you know, a six or seven or an eight body score, your vet can help you decide that. Um, your, your horse may be getting too many carbohydrates and um, it could be causing um, inflammation in its whole body, but most importantly for this topic, it's feet. And it could be causing laminitis that you don't even know about. I know that sounds crazy, but horses can have subclinical laminitis and you can see that happening before they have a real acute episode where they're lame. So understand these little signs. Um, if your horse is maybe last to come in from the field, if you see hoof rings, if you see them being tender on hard surfaces when they weren't, if their necks become hard and they have undulating tissue and lumpy hard tissue around their neck or, or their tail head, they develop a fatty sheath. These are all signs of carbohydrate overload and potentially insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So um, it's very important that you, you keep an eye on your horses and um, don't let them get laminitis. You know, you can, you can avoid that altogether. If your horse's foot sore because it's been on the grass and it's gotten too much starch and sugar from the grass, um, your horse is in a lot of pain and it's unnecessary pain. So you need to notice before their feet fall off, literally, because it, it can be that bad. You know, I don't want to scare anyone and use fear tactics, but I just want you to know that um, you have the power 
to observe and make decisions uh, before things get ugly. So I don't ever, you know, I don't ever blame people for that happening. Sometimes we don't know and we don't notice and that happens, but now you, you were, have- Tony, you were talking about uh, an appropriate mineral balance. Can you give us a right. resource so we know what what is an appropriate mineral balance? Yeah. Where can you find information about that? So I, I would say that um, the most evidence-based source that I know of um, that can teach you about mineral balance is the ECDIR group. And that stands for the Equine Cushings and Insulin Resistant Group. It's- um, Say it one more time, Equine e Cushings. E-C-I-R, Equine Cushings and okay. Insulin Resistant Group. Um, it was started by a veterinarian named Dr. Eleanor Kellen. Um, oh, she's, okay. She's a large case study body. Um, she has provided the the biggest group of evidence based um, case histories, but and recommendations. And her theory is based on science and um, and research that she's done on her own. Um, case history so um, her she has a, a full forum where she likes you to fill out a whole history about your horse and um, from there she can give you personally tailored information you can submit a hay report and she and other professionals on that forum can provide you with a custom supplement uh, well they oh, can cool. provide you with a, a recipe for a custom supplement they can balance your horse's total diet and um, and then there are other companies that you can have make that custom supplement but there's a lot of information about general horse keeping but also about hay analysis and balancing your hay with minerals and um, also just understanding grass so um, if you want to learn more about grass and sugars and fructans um there's um there's a woman named kathy watts uh with safergrass.org she's a grass master she is a scientist that focuses on grass um and she can tell you everything you need to know about pasture management and how to how to uh graze your horses safely um so that you can avoid these problems altogether and your horse can have a normal lifestyle and doesn't have to live on a dry lot for the rest of its life. You can keep things in balance mm -hmm. if you're proactive. So learn from those people. They're very educated. They are, they're leaders in their field. And that's why I really respect them because they really care about horses and they've, they've, they're, they've done their, their homework as scientists. So I appreciate that. So um, another thing I want to talk about is lifestyle. Oh, good. That's go ahead. You can ask your question. No, that's what I was going to ask about exercise oh. and about movement. Yeah. Um, motion is lotion. <laughs> that is that's one thing to know. It's good for arthritis, but it's also good for circulation. And um, so lifestyle or something uh, or a few things about it, it, lifestyle and environment that are important. Um, you want a clean, dry environment for the most part for your horse. Um, if they have some, some exposure to water throughout the day on their hooves, if they walk through a creek or if they have a little wet spot by the water tub, that's a, that's a fine thing to do. Um, but if they, their feet are saturated all the time, and we have that problem here in New Jersey a lot, um, if you have a paddock that doesn't drain well or holds water in mucky areas, if you have composts like in front of your run-in shed or something like that, um, that is not a good situation. So you, you wanna avoid mucky, wet areas that your horse has to stand in. What do we want in front of our run-in shed? Well, there are some things we can do. Um, there, are, there are resources that can give you ideas about dry lots and how to do proper excavation for that and, and proper ways to lay stone layers, base layers, and sand. Some people like pea gravel. Um, I find that in front of a run-in, sometimes that's not the best. I like a pea gravel section, but I like sand. I, I honestly, I guess maybe I'm biased 
from South Jersey, <laughs> but I think sand filters well, and it's also supportive. Horses like to lie down in it. Um, it's easy to sift through when you when you clean it. You can clean manure out of it pretty easily. Um, there are some different um, stone dust materials, and um, a friend of mine um, who recommends dry lots for horses and helps people make dry lots. She she recommends a, a byproduct of the steel industry actually called slag and she builds her dry lots with that and it's like stone dust. It's not angular and you have to make sure that it's clean slag and there's no metal in it. It's like filtered. Um, so that's an option. Stone dust is an option easy to clean it packs down um, it's not angular you don't want sharp rocks um, especially if your horse's hooves are a little compromised um, round stones are better a thick layer of round stones um, or more than an inch or two I think about two or three inches is recommended by folks like Pete Ramey Pete really loves pea gravel especially on a track system so um, I'll talk a little bit about a track system. Um, that's another little lifestyle adjustment you can make. It's basically a track. Uh, I can even show you a picture of it. You have one. <laughs> Marianne has one on her farm. If you've ever been to Marianne's farm, you can see her paddock paradise. Um, you can lay down different footing and different material on that track. You can do sand. You can do areas of pea gravel or sand. Um, that, the, th the biggest thing about the track system is it encourages movement. Yeah. Yeah. So the horses, you place hay along that track system. That's or whatever. Idea. So it could be hay in one place, minerals in another water far away from hay. Right. And all that far away from the shed. So, yeah. for, you know, they have to walk to get the hay or they have to walk to get the water. Yeah. Here, I'll show you a few little pictures of, um, while you're looking, I have a question. Can you, can you look and listen to this question at the same time, Tony? Sure. I, I'll sure try. Well, this is, a, it's kind of a little, there's a little story up from Alice about her. Um, it's a horse that she's had five or six months. Um, the horse started to re drag his rear, um, hoof and it's definitely bull nosed in appearance in his hind legs his hind feet. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed like that that happened over the course of just one six week trim cycle. Mm -hmm. and, um, she doesn't want him to go downhill. He, he feels right. lame. So she's wondering, um, he's a thin soled thoroughbred with long sloping pasterns. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that kind of confirmation, um, lends itself if he actually does have long sloping pasterns it will set him up to have lower heels and load the back of his foot more and maybe have a negative plantar angle but i also believe that she should find an osteopath someone who understands the horse's biomechanics and helps rehabilitate horses with that um, whenever i hear of horses dragging toes um, I think of it as a pelvic issue more often than not. Many vets and farriers be believe, and it's it's been known that it's been said that horses that have um, dub toes in the hind or squared off toes, horses that drag their hind feet have have a um, a um, a knee issue, a stifle issue, but. I've learned recently that it actually is more often than not a pelvic issue, a sacroiliac issue, or um, even just your horse's posture while riding. If he's in a hollow posture and his pelvis is rotated outward, he's, his spine is in extension, he's not able to, uh, to move his joints in a way that is really beneficial to him and may cause him to drag a toe or or both. Um, but if you're looking at the hoof and you're noticing um, very clear imbalances, if he has a bull nose appearance to his toe, um, there may also be a, a hoof balance or trimming um, that could be improved upon. So my suggestion is find an osteopath, 
Mm. and uh, get their opinion and then um, have them communicate with your farrier get your team going yep cool good advice yeah. cool these are great pictures look at those rocks in that second picture I know. like whoo. like talk about rock crunching hooves i don't yeah. I, I don't know how many horses could uh, really deal with that in our wet northeastern environment um, right but if you had that they would learn that they would learn that and if you found a way to keep this pretty dry and if you kept mm -hmm. their feet dry um, mm -hmm. i actually uh, have a story about dry in terrain i have two stories but i'll just tell one the most impressive one i think i had a client who lived here in new jersey and we both know her but she had two little quarter horses and she boarded at a wonderful place in new jersey and the horses were in a pasture and the pasture got wet um a lot and it wasn't like muddy or dirty or anything it was just a you know a wet pasture and the horses suffered from thrush and she was constantly treating for thrush and the soles were soft and the horses would get sore on rocks and the soles were flaky and chalky and a little retracted and they had some little white line separations well she moved to new mexico <laughs> with those horses and i said you know what report back in about, I don't know, two months and tell me what your horse's feet look like. So she called me in about two months and she said, you are not going to believe how incredibly hard and strong and sound my horse's feet are. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I do believe it because you're in New Mexico. So, uh, you yeah, know, hard, dry, hot, hot environment. So those mm -hmm. hooves, could adapt to this terrain in no time and but if we said, had this terrain and i mean if we had not just a little piece of it but if this is what our horses lived on they would be able to run on that stuff you know it's just like, there's what? an old saying that you you know you should bed your horse on what you want to ride on you know mm -hmm. so yeah if they were exposed to this they would adapt but you have to apply some common sense. If yeah. your horse has thin soles or is, uh, has foundered and is laminitic or just has soft feet and is living in a wet environment and is exposed to these rocks, you're going to have subsolar abscesses. You're yeah, not going really to have funny. rock crunching hooves. <laughs> you're going to have a bruised, sore, painful hoof. So can you can you yeah. click on this picture with the over here, the first, the second one on the bottom on the left? This one yeah, or this one? one? No, no, the one next to it. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, if we can just have a look at that because um, maybe you can, if it if it does show up, it can it can be a little wider because that's an example. The way they've done it is an yeah. example of of putting different stations. So if you have a square pasture, like you can see the big outer fence, right? At one point, this was just a big wide square pasture. This is really common. In New Jersey, right? This is how we keep our horses in these big giant pastures. And what they've done Sorry. is is they've created this 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 track system Sorry. in the middle of their big square pasture. So they can still use that pasture for grazing, but it's not like the horses are gonna live on it. You know, they're gonna be, you know, have a period of time when it's safe for them or whenever right. it is. Right to be able to be out on that. It's fine, Tony, you could, it's, it's fine. I think they got the sense of it, you know, like you, you can put yeah. like hay in one place, right. and water in another, and your minerals yeah. in another, and your loafing shed in another, and. Can you, can you see it? No, no, all we're seeing is you're sharing your screen and it's not showing us anything, but that's okay, yeah. it's, it's 825. I had an unstable internet connection. For yeah. It's okay. No, oh, it's back, but it's fine. I mean, you guys, you see I'll the Google stop. search. Yeah, you see the Google search. It's Paddock Paradise. You, you can do that as well and get yeah. some ideas about your own track system because it isn't natural for horses to live on acres and acres of lush grazing, you know, and, right. and many horses suffer because of it. So, right. We like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right. We we think that horses are uh, supposed to be on lush grass and uh, be out in the pasture all the time. And um, I think that we, we, because we have a misunderstanding of what a wild horse's lifestyle is really like. They, they're not grazing on lush grass. They're, they're browsing 
and they're usually eating sparse forage. So just understand that. Um, so and all kinds of other things. They're not just eating grass. They're eating shrubs and sticks right. and bark and you know dirt and minerals that they're finding and all kinds of things that are not just grass you know weeds and plants and flowers and trees and leaves and all of it and they're walking 25 miles a day right <laughs> they're not just standing around you know waiting for us to spend our one hour with them or however long we do that so right so that's an important part is exercise inside of um, lifestyle. Can you, um, and unless there's any more questions, you guys, Tony, if you can, if you could, if you could just one more time, if you could find us a picture of a, a horse with fabulous hooves, all four. So we can look at a posture of, you know, like what does a horse look like when it's, you know, standing square and comfortable in all four feet, you know, on the ground. Right. Let's, let's see if I can do that for yep. you. And then anybody, if, if you have any last questions, now's the time. Now's the time to put them in the, in the chat because um, yeah. we'll be leaving. And then I will be sure you guys to, uh, in the, in the, uh, on the event page, I'm going to put a whole bunch of resources in there. I've written a whole bunch of stuff down and I'm going to, um, I'm going to definitely put a whole bunch of um, pictures in there for you. But this is yeah. nice because we, we could look up healthy horse posture and maybe not actually find one. So if we can get somebody with Tony's expertise to right. show us, you know, a horse that actually is in their right. feet, standing still. And these are probably some good examples of horses that are uncomfortable. <laughs> right. Well, this horse looks pretty comfortable. I'm, yeah. Can you see this screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Can you see my screen? Screen, Mary. Yes, yes, we can definitely see your screen, and he is standing nice and square um, on all four feet. So this, this horse is. Uh oh, we're losing Tony. Well, it does look square. It does look right. comfortable to me. I mean, he's standing square. He obviously doesn't have terribly long feet right. or anything like that. I mean, you can see he's standing over his. You know, his right. shoulders are right. over and his feet. His hips are over his feet. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So his cannon bones are perpendicular to the ground, They're straight up and down. They're not angled back. They're not angled forward. Mm -hmm. He has a nice round, soft appearance of his top line. His spine looks rather nice. He's got a nice bascule forward in his neck. Mm -hmm. His person is actually talking to his his chest muscles, his thoracic sling. So he's kind of nice and up and round just standing here. Mm -hmm. This is nice and flat and round. And, you know, he looks pretty comfortable to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good. Here's a horse um, that's being ridden that I think is, uh, if it will load, <laughs> um, he looks rather balanced. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to load. Not pushing too far behind, so, stepping up under himself. That's a shame. Yeah. Well, but you, we can see, we can see. Can you see um, them? Can you? Well, what we can see is the, we can see your Google search, healthy horse posture. Little. We're looking for this paint right here, the one in the center. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this guy. He's just got a nice round arc of his top line. The area behind the saddle is rounded out. It's not hollow. Mm -hmm. um, he looks like he's reaching to the bridle and he's not being compressed by his rider's hands. And he's just got nice, even strides here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A nice W. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's almost in the, the footprint of his forelimb here. These bones are parallel, so his hind leg cannon bone is in line with his foreleg cannon bone. Mm -hmm. So I would say that this guy's he's a pretty comfortable character. He looks Good. like a happy little boy. Yeah. So when you see your horses walking across the pasture, look for that. Yeah. You know, look for that. And if you don't see that, look to see what is what is not that. It's kind of a famous little thing I, I say is, um, you know, uh, Michelangelo took two years every single day to carve <laughs> David out of the statue, a block of, of marble. 
And what he said yeah. was, you know, when asked how he did that, he said, well, I took away everything that wasn't David. And that's a good, um, it's just kind of a good way to think about that. Because if you're not seeing David, then why not? You know, right. if you're not seeing these nice soft top line or you're not seeing a, a balanced horse, if you're not seeing a horse that looks even front and back, you know, why yeah. not? What, what is the problem? Right. This, this is, is Manolo. Yeah. yeah, this is Manolo Mendez. This is another nice, soft posture. And you can see there's just ease of movement here. This horse is really stepping with his inside hind leg and mm -hmm. he just looks free in his body. Mm -hmm. um, if your horse has hoof pain, it will restrict his movement and it will make it more difficult for him or even impossible for him to move with good biomechanics. So mm -hmm. um, it is good to look at posture. Yep. Stuff's going to show up. <laughs> yeah. good. That's it. I think that's a nice picture to leave us on. Cause that, who doesn't want to ride that horse? I do. Yeah. <laughs> and there's something about a nice, good brown horse that, that is uh, <laughs> good for my heart and soul, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, very good. Um, oh, Candace is looking for one more thing. Don't forget about behaviors from hoof pain. Like how, what, what behaviors might right. our horse start um, displaying? Um, Don't leave us on pictures of that though. I won't leave you on pictures. We'll, we'll leave Manolo here with his nice yes. pony. Um, so some behaviors. Um, first, I'll start with what I experience as a farrier is um, a horse that has a, has a hard time standing to be trimmed or shod. If they're uh, bearing weight, especially on concrete or a hard surface and on, on the limb that you're are not holding up so the opposite limb of the one you're holding up and he's he's loading his opposite hoof and he starts to squirm around and get uncomfortable i mean some horses will even go as far to rear and snatch their leg out and stamp their foot down you'll usually notice if they are sore in their feet and you're trying to trim them and they slam their foot down or they behave erratically when they put that foot down they will lift the opposite one up as to take weight off of it Mm -hmm. has to say ow my foot hurt mm -hmm. so what i'll do with those horses a lot of times i'll put them in a boot i carry a pair of um easy boot glove or uh, easy boot clouds with me rather they have a very nice memory foam pad and uh, i mean more often than not you put them in a comfy padded boot and they're more than happy to stand for you mm -hmm. so, that's a telltale sign that's a really good one yeah um horses that um that start to get upset or can't stand when a farrier is nailing a shoe on is a horse with laminar pain. That horse has inflammation in its foot. And even, even the best farrier that's uh, able to drive a nail in the appropriate place um, can make, that can make a horse sore. Um, so that's something to think about also. Um, another thing, um, it's just a change in behavior. Um, if you're, if you notice that your horse starts to assume unusual postures, um, camping out, stretching its forelimbs forward and its hind limbs back, and sort of arcing its back, that's mm -hmm. a sign of uh, usually toe pain, and um, it can be back pain too, but it's usually hoof pain mm -hmm. or stomach pain. It can be, but you know, so just look at your horse's posture and their movement. Um, mm -hmm notice yeah like a high head when you're riding yeah you know. high head short stride mm -hmm. change of stride from soft to hard surface um that's a really telltale sign horses that um don't don't want to like horses that will trot instead of canter they'll trot 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 really fast and they won't want to take a canter can yeah it can be anything but there are a number there are a number of things that can cause that but also mm -hmm. um just short strides like you're saying there are a lot of horses that will race and rush mm -hmm. and do a really fast choppy trot you'll notice mm -hmm. shortness of the stride in mm -hmm. trot and it will be fast and just short mm -hmm. um and then things like lying down more often uh if your horse is taking a load off of its feet um He's probably going through some laminitis pain. Um, toe first landing. If you walk your horse on a hard surface and you notice that the dirt 
um, shoots out with every stride. If your horse is kicking up a lot of dirt and you're noticing it's jabbing its toes in the sand, it's probably having some heel pain. Um, you, can, you can actually look at a hoof print in the dirt to see that. Yeah, you can see that it will be um, more defined and it will be deeper in the toe. Um, you can stand your horse on a pad also and see what sort of impression it makes. Uh, hoof, hoof pads and, and boots will tell you a lot about how your horse is loading their feet. Um, so um, yeah, other, other herd behavior uh, can tell you some things about your horse's overall attitude, but hoof pain, if they're, if they're last to come in and all the other horses are cantering in and your horse is trotting or even walking, um mm -hmm. and he usually doesn't do that um that's also a sign of distress of hoof pain or other pain yeah and tony you were saying um earlier about cases where you've seen that pain in the mouth or teeth problems show up as as looking like lameness when it's really not a problem with the foot at all right. but it's a it's a problem in the mouth so that that's right. why you know that it's it is a you know the shin bones connected you know to the <laughs> ankle bone right <laughs> yeah it's and, all connected and and that's why it is important to have a very knowledgeable team that understands those connections mm -hmm. um, osteopaths and dentists that do equilibration and um, really understand the connection between the feet and the teeth and the body those are the kinds of people that that can help you put these puzzle pieces together and help your horse be as sound as they can. I mean, and it, it works both ways. If the feet are very out of balance, it can also cause a malocclusion, which is a misalignment of the jaw. If a horse is assuming a unusual posture because its feet are out of balance, mm -hmm. it can affect their proprioception, it can affect the way they hold themselves, hold their entire skeleton, mm -hmm. and um, it can affect their jaw. And, uh, and then vice versa, if they uh, have an issue with their TMJ or their jaw and, um, you know, the TMJ joint, the temporal mandibular joint is very close to the inner ear and it affects your balance and your proprioception. Um, if you have a malocclusion and um, causes you to tilt your head, a horse will see the horizon differently and will, it will cause it to load its feet differently. Mm -hmm. So there are cases where I've come in and I've trimmed the feet to my best ability and they didn't come around. And then we had the teeth done and the feet just fell into place beautifully. So yeah. it's all connected. Yeah. And that's the importance of a team. And I, Tony, I think that's a great place for us to end today because it's, yeah. it's, it's 840. We have had these people here 40 minutes longer than we told. Oh, Lord. Thank you. Uh, all yeah. So staying. God bless those of you who stayed. <laughs> Your horses will appreciate and thank you for it. Uh, Cause you know, that's the nature of them. Thank you, Tony, so much for all of your help today. Thank you for your, um, you know, just thank you for your knowledge and your love of the horses and your willingness to, you know, go the extra mile to really find out whatever there is to find out for the health of horses. And thank you for your patience with horse owners who um, don't always listen. And yeah, because you know, <laughs> I'm sure you tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them. And then you say, I'm sure I can't trim your horse's hooves anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that happens, unfortunately, but um, I do my best to stay in the game for the horses, yeah. and and it, it usually works out well. You know, I, yeah. I've just found that I found some really excellent, loving horse people out in the world, and it makes me hopeful. So um, Me too. You know, I, I'm excited for the people that do listen and, yep. and that do really care for their horses. So I yeah. thank them and uh, I thank you for inviting me to do this. It's my pleasure. Yeah, hopefully, you know, my goal is always to just help my students to learn more and train their eye and, you know, keep getting better for the love of the horse. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, everyone. You're welcome, Candace. Thank you so much. And I will, I will definitely put all these resources in the, um, in the event, on the event page. So I won't live there very long. So uh, check in there later and, and jot them down. 
Okay. Okay. Sounds All right. Good. Bye, everyone. Bye.